Hello, everyone, and a very warm welcome to today's iCentury Connect session. Uh, we're meeting today just a few days after the observance of the International Day of People with Disabilities, which is held annually on the 3rd of December. Uh, this is a day which aims to mobilize support for those with disabilities, as well as raise awareness on the causes and the extent of disabilities worldwide, and all importantly, on what can be done to ultimately prevent or at the very least mitigate the global burden of disabilities. And now in parallel to this, it's also fact that neglected tropical diseases often cause substantial and long lasting disabilities. And within these neglected tropical diseases, snake bite and snake bite envenoming remain a significantly underestimated cause of disability and most devastatingly often in already extremely vulnerable and economically impoverished communities. When it comes to snake bite envenoming, the spotlight is often on the challenges of anti-venoms, uh, the practical financial regulatory gaps, gaps sorry, in both production and access. But today, um, and particularly with people with disabilities in mind, we would like to support this year's theme for the International Day of People with Disabilities and broaden the discussions to looking well beyond these issues around antivenoms. And so for this, we'll take a closer look today over the next 90 minutes at some very important and multifaceted strategies and programs which aim to boost the capacity of the healthcare sector, as well as vulnerable communities themselves to prevent and respond to snake bite envenoming with a really a view to making a significant dent in the poorly, under, the poorly understood consequences of snake bite and, all importantly, the 400,000 permanent disabilities they cause. And so with all this in mind and given this background, it's my great pleasure today on behalf of the International Society for Neglected Tropical Diseases to welcome our three speakers who will be sharing perspectives and practical solutions from Nigeria, Malawi and India to tackling snake bite as a health threat, a significant cause of disability and economic inequality, and more generally, a public health threat of global concern. So I am sure that you will join me in welcoming very warmly our speaker. Uh, firstly, um, we will hear about the incredible and difficult work of Dr. Agom Ibrahim, uh, Dr. Agom, welcome to this ICNTD Connect. It's lovely to have you here. It's a pleasure. Thank you for joining us. You are a medical doctor, a 2021 Mandela Washington Fellow, and founder of the Snake Bite Control Network, or SCONET, based in Nigeria, working really tirelessly to treat and support those affected by snake bite. We really look forward to hearing from you. And following this, we're also delighted to welcome uh, Mr. Moses Banda Aaron. Welcome, Moses. Hi. Hi, Moses. You are Monitoring and Evaluation Manager at Partners in Health, or Abwenzi Baza Umoyo in Malawi. And you're also a research associate at the Snake and Venoming Group at the Bernard Noch Institute of Tropical Medicine. Uh, thank you so much for joining us and we'll be hearing more about some important research supported by the Royal Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene and the Bernard Noch Institute on tackling snake bites at the community level in Malawi, specifically to reduce disabilities. Thank you for your time today. And following this, it's also a great pleasure. Our third speaker today will be Dr. Preeti Meena. Uh, welcome, Preeti, and thank you for joining us. Hello. Hi, Preeti. Uh, you are a nephrologist and based at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences. A very warm welcome to you. And you'll be concluding our discussions with some important insights into the morbidity and the chronic effects of snake bite and what this means for those affected. And with all these presentations, with a view to really delving deeper in what can be done at the primary health care and also at the community level to make a marked and distinct impact on disabilities worldwide. 
So thank you so much. Uh, there's a lot of topic to cover, some really incredible work at the grassroots level to, to, be, to be covered in these 90 minutes. So without any further delay, uh, I'd like to hand over first and foremost to set the scene and also share with us some findings and some insights into work at the community level on Snakebite uh, to Dr. Agom. Uh, to find out a little bit more about snake bite envenoming uh, in a very general sense, but also some incredible work uh, right at the forefront in primary health care, um, helping very vulnerable communities. Agom, over to you. Thank you very much, Marianne. Hello, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure for me to be here. And I really appreciate Marianne and the whole um, ISNTD Connect team for giving me the opportunity. Okay, my name is uh, Dr. Agom Ibrahim. Uh, just to give a little background um, as I continue. Um, I'm a medical uh, doctor. Currently, I work with the Federal Teaching Hospital, Gombe. Um, before then, I had worked, my interest in snake bite was um, awakened when I worked with the Snake Bite Treatment and Research Hospital for about three years from 2019 to uh, 2021. Um, while there, I had the privilege to manage um, over 5,000 patients of snake bite and venom. And it's also worthy of note to mention that the Snake Bite Treatment and Research Hospital located in Gombe State is um, the first of its kind in Nigeria and perhaps as far as I know the world, um, that is exclusively dedicated to the management of, of uh, snake bite patients. And perhaps that explains, you know, the high number of snake bite patients that we see, you know, in that facility. So, so while at the facility, my interest was awakened in the area of snake bite. Before then, and like many other medical doctors, I have very little contact with uh, snake bite and venom and I knew very, very little um, as regards to snake bite. Um, all right, um, so if you are with me, um, you would see the famous Kilang Mountain, which is located in Kaltungo, Gombe State, in the background. Um, it's um, a typical savanna setting. Uh, it's one of the highest mountains in northeastern Nigeria. Um, standing at over 1,000 feet. Um, and it still presents the typical environment in Kaltungo district of Gombe State, um, which is famous for snake bite and venom. And that was part of why the hospital was located, you know, in that environment. It actually presents a good ecological environment for snakes to thrive, you know, given the stones and um, the good um, weather for snakes to thrive in that environment. Um, as I continue, um, my approach would be slightly different from uh, that of Moses. Um, I hope to be able to awaken um, your interest, first of all, in snake bite and venom, and to speak to our humanity much more than I would be discussing about numbers, because these are people, these are lives. I'll be sharing um, 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 stories of people. I'll be sharing lived experiences of people. And, and that is how I want us to be able to look at you know, this presentation. And I hope that by the end of the presentation, I would have um, been able to awaken your interest you know, in the aspect of snake bite and venom. And though we call it a neglected tropical disease, I hope that by the end of the um, presentation, it will no longer, you know, remain neglected. I mean, even if the world will neglect it, um, we as individuals, as organizations, will stand to do something about it. Now, to begin with, um, I will be sharing this image. Um, it's from the Wellcome Trust, um, which states that for every five minutes, 50 people are bitten by a snake, and out of which 25 will be injected you know, with venom, four will be permanently disabled, and uh, one person will die. Now, um, if you think about it, in the space of this presentation, which um, would likely hold um, be for about 20 minutes, um, the implication is that about 200, in the space of the time I'll be presenting, about 200 people will have been bitten by a snake, and about 100 will have been injected with venom, 
and um, um, you know about about uh, 16 will be permanently disabled you know and about four will die resulting from a snake bite within the space of you know the presentation now just think about that now people ask me that why do i take snake bites so seriously why of all diseases of all conditions why am i so engrossed by you know snake bite victims and snake bite patients now to answer this question uh, my organization came up with uh, 10 top reasons why snake bites should be taken very very seriously by the world now globally there are over 5 million cases um, of snake bite and venom, um, resulting in over 125,000 deaths. Some of these figures have been given earlier by in the course of uh, Moses' presentation. In sub Saharan Africa, about 12,000 people die from snake bite and venom, 14,000 amputations occur, and over 55,000 you know, patients present with um, uh, develop post traumatic stress disorder as well as other more chronic uh, psychological illnesses. Now, snake bites, you know, is the most neglected of the neglected tropical diseases. And unlike most neglected tropical diseases, it has a potent treatment which, if instituted early, could result in an almost total reversal of symptoms. It affects mostly the rural poor, illiterates, um, usually with little or no political voice, and it is left with many mythologies that negatively impact treatment. And again, treatment of snake bite is really really costly for the poor um, um, a single vial of antivenom for instance would cost um, a little over one thousand dollars and sometimes patients will require more than two uh, to as many as six now if you place that you know in perspective that in nigeria for instance uh, a very good number live uh, below the two dollar margin now you'd understand why snake bite treatment is actually very very costly sometimes uh, people have to sell their prized possessions to be able to cater for snake bite victims now snake bite poses many socioeconomic problems with an impact equal to and exceeding that of many neglected tropical diseases um, it contrib contributes to many issues that challenges the overall quality of life for not only the victims but also their families and communities and um, this figure um, was a result of uh, a research conducted by the Global Snake Bite Initiative, you know, um, which has found out that for every one dollar um, result of uh, economic uh, projections, uh, which revealed that uh, for every one dollar invested in the management of snake bite, it has the potential of yielding uh, four dollars to the global economy eventually. And then it's uh, worthy of note that most countries, uh, African countries, do not have definitive policies that specifically address the problem of snake bites. I know that is the experience in Nigeria, and I've, speak, I've spoken to many um, you know, um, healthcare workers in African countries, and um, it's a recurring decimal. And then finally, there's vast room for partnerships and collaboration in the area of snake bite, uh, a lot of which has been left unexplored. But I hope that we'll be able to form these partnerships uh, in the course of this presentation and subsequently. Um, sorry, I can't see my slides. Hello, Marianne. Yeah, hi, Agam. Um, has your screen gone blank or? No. Yes, it went blank. When I click on next. Yeah, because uh, we can see them really well. Uh, I mean, I can. I'm sure our attendees can. What I might do is stop the slide presentation and then restart it. <clears throat> okay. Has that helped at all? Yes, that has helped. Okay. It's back. Thank God. Thank you very Put much. It off and on tends to be my answer to everything. I'm just grateful Sorry when for it worked. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. So to understand the uh, snake bite uh, envenomment in Africa, um, um, first of all, we need to understand the culprits. Um, in Africa, we also have uh, the African Big Four. Um, I was talking with uh, uh, Pretty earlier of uh, the Indian Big Four, and we have a similar thing uh, here in Africa. And um, 
actually there are four families of uh, venomous snakes uh, you know that are most important in africa um, the viperidae groups the colubridae elapids and then the hydrophides um, however um, only about four species are the most are the most important causes of envenomin um, uh, among which are the the soskelt uh, carpet Viper of Arden, uh, Echis oscillatus, uh, Leucogaster, Menalolica. However, the Echis oscillatus is the most uh, predominant. And then, secondly, there's the black naked, uh, black naked spitting. In a just species. And then there's the percent of bites and 60% of deaths is caused by the carpet viper, particularly the Echis species, Echis oscillatus. Um, now, um, in the local dialect, uh, it's important to note how um, these various species are in very important in certain communities. For instance, in the in Hausa, um, they call the carpet viper go back on this to speak of uh, the venomous nature of uh, you know the snake species now this picture represents um, the various um, uh, species that i've mentioned this is the carpet viper and then there's the spitting cobra you can see um, the spit the venom spit it can travel as far as seven meters and is very accurate uh, this is the the puff adder in the top left and then this is uh, the black mamba uh, the black mamba is actually called that uh, because of the black uh, coloration of the oral cavity uh, not the color of the skin now clinical patterns of envenomin uh, basically there are um, quite a number of syndromes but the most common ones are five cytotoxicity hematotoxicity neurotoxicity myotoxicity cardiotoxicity and then snake venom ophthalmia However, in most uh, instances, uh, mixed envenomin um, would occur. Now, cytotoxicity is primarily um, characterized by uh, local swellings and uh, formation of uh, um, bullae, um, sometimes uh, is blood stand. And that is in the early stage. In the late stages, it results in uh, um, a complete uh, escoration of of this necrosis and uh, ultimately infections could set in if it has not been attended to. Um, Hematotoxicity could uh, bleeding, you know, from the bite site, or in some instances, uh, distant bleeding, systemic uh, bleeding, and that bleeding can actually occur anywhere, um, and it's common with uh, viparides, uh, particularly. In the carpet viper um, as you can see in this instance uh, you can see the bleeding from uh, the various cuts you know um, by a traditionalist where these black stones were applied you can see the large bullet formation here and then the thick uh, uh, blood that is formed now this figure here is of a woman that was beaten but however the bleeding was manifesting with um, bleeding from the ear in her ear instance and then in this case we can see bleeding in the conjunctiva uh, which is a systemic manifestation um, of the viparidae species and in this case uh, this um, neurotoxic this patient particularly was bitten by this particular snake uh, the naja species the black necked uh, spitting cobra the alien presentation that existed however death um, and then uh, snake venom ophthalmia um, refers to the range of uh, clinical manifestations resulting from snake bite that could occur in the eye either resulting from the directly from the venom itself or when there is a uh, spit into the eye by a uh, spitting cobra for instance um, in this case you can see um, subconjunctival uh, uh, collection uh, in the eye, whereas this woman presented uh, about a week after she was beaten, 
Uh, she, after she had uh, a carpet bypass bit into the eye, you can see corneal ulceration and um, scoriation. This other patient here presented to the facility um, with a two weeks history of uh, suspected uh, carpet viper, I mean, um, spitting cobra um, and venom into the eye. And uh, if, as you can see, the eye is already sealed off and is a much uh, collection of pus and uh, ophthalmitis has already set in. So we had to refer her to the tertiary facility for management. However, we've learned that uh, subsequently the patient died. Now complications that could arise from snake bite um, uh, varied, uh, could arise actually partly from the first aid uh, that the patient received and then the home remedies that are applied, uh, which include tonic, oral topical concoctions that are given, the various incisions that could be made, application of hot water and use of black stones. And then complications from the toxin itself, uh, which results in the various manifestations we've seen earlier. And then there could be um, superimposed infections, uh, either from pyogenic bacteria or uh, toxins from uh, tetanus, for instance. And then complications could also arise from the antivenom itself, uh, adverse reactions, uh, usually urticarial rashes, and in a few instances, um, 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 edema and uh, anaphylactic would receive. Now, these complications, uh, like I mentioned, in severe cases, disseminated intervascular coagulation, kidney injury, um, which Dr. Pretty will be speaking to us later on, uh, and then other long term complications. Uh, chronic depression, psychosis, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, it could result in amputations and so on and so forth. Um, these are some examples of uh, the ones we have seen. Um, you can see this, uh, this small boy had his uh, right thumb amputated, so innocent. Um, he's unaware of what is actually ongoing. But he had his right thumb amputated. You can imagine how that this one, uh, uh, this patient was actually beaten. Eleven result in you can see what is left of the right foot. Um, all the limbs is gone, remaining this uh, uh, um, thumb. That is left. So, majority of you know the victims of snake bite are the economic pro economically productive group, and it has these bites have and the complications that develop have enormous economic burden you know on the family, uh, given that the breadwinners are the ones that are mostly affected. Now, these are a picture representing the various traditional methods of treatment. Uh, research has shown that over in the hospital where I worked, uh, for instance, over ninety percent. You know, of the patients will have had some form of traditional, um, you know, um, uh, had received some form of traditional treatment prior to presenting at the hospital. And then it's very common to see, you know, these various uh, traditional methods. This is an, um, you know, very traditional methods, uh, concoctions that are applied, and uh, in some instances, um, you can see these uh, anklets and um, you know all sorts of uh, you know traditional concoction. This is a concoction that the patient brought in. It was who was taking it uh, prior to presentation. Now, um, as we all know, the prime, the 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 most important you know factor in the management of uh, snake bite and venom is early administration of antivenom. However, here in Africa. Antivenom is uh, ranges from the supply to access uh, to delays and then to the adverse reactions, which I was spoken about earlier. Now, this graph here um, is showing it's uh, this picture was gotten from the Global Snake Bite Initiative website, 
and it shows the commitment by existing laboratories to provide antivenom for other regions. As you can see, uh, in Africa, you know, um, it's only South Africa that is able to produce its own antivenom. Um, all other regions are unable to produce. Um, so the first challenge that has to do with antivenom is the market failure. Um, there is low demand for quality antivenom by governments who assign snake bite as a low priority. And then um, there's cheaper but ineffective antivenom crowding the market, of which uh, many instances, you know, patients get exposed to. Um, and although, you know, patients thought they had been treated, uh, eventually it results in uh, terrible mortalities and morbidities. And then thirdly, the major challenge is a lack of quality control and regulation of uh, the antivenom market. So there's proliferation of cheaper alternatives compared to the more effective but uh, much more costlier, um, you know, um, uh, antivenoms. And then again, you know, which one is effective and which one is not. So in many instances, you see that patient would have received so many valves of antivenom without, you know, having any um, effect. Now this graph actually uh, represents, um, you know, um, you know, a trial of an antivenom uh, that was done. Uh, you can see this yellow one is the effective. This blue one is the less effective one. Uh, and then what this was able to achieve uh, was the number that the yellow could achieve. Um, this graph, uh, the next challenge has to do with the high cost of antivenom. Uh, as you can see, uh, this graph was actually called from um, a research, you know, by um, Brown in the PLOS uh, journal, uh, which revealed that antivenom prices could actually be lowered by increasing the output. You know, um, the higher the number that is produced, the lesser the um, the cost, you know, of antivenom production. However, because there is market failure, the cost is higher, and um, there is less demand in the in regions that much need it. Um, there is very uh, many companies have, in fact, closed down their production of antivenom because it is not uh, um, economically um, productive. And then the next challenge has to do with delay in presentation. Um, this was highlighted by Professor Habib, uh, who is the Nigerian Snake Bar Research and Intervention Center um, uh, Clinical uh, Chief Investigator. And then uh, we realized that snake bite and venom in, uh, Has, uh, which has to do with primary delay. Um, the primary delay has to do with delay in seeking appropriate uh, medical help um, and sometimes uh, gender issues, gender inequalities uh, issues uh, come into play. Second, um, there's the reasons of this time occur in mostly in the inner rural areas and sometimes before the patient presents at the hospital, um, um, the venom would have uh, transversed the whole much more complex. Then thirdly here, uh, and this has to do with both the uh, availability of antivenom as well as the expertise you know, of the medical personnel um, managing the patient. Now, um, other challenges uh, were as identified by the Coffin Annan Foundation in 2016. Uh, they had a meeting um, with a view to curbing the, you know, the public health challenges of uh, snake bite and venom, and they came up with uh, a number of uh, challenges, you know, that were identified. The first of which was a lack of accurate disease burden data. WHO has made several efforts to curb snake bite and venom. In 2017, they recategorized uh, snake bite into the category A neglected tropical disease. And um, several other efforts have been made. Uh, for instance, in 2019, they came up with uh, this particular roadmap, uh, which seeks to reduce the burden of snake bite and venom by at least 50% by the year 2030. And this uh, was to be rolled out in three phases, uh, the first one, first two, and first three. Um, well, um, 
here in the, the local communities, I must say that you know the impact of this roadmap is honest, truly yet to be felt. Um, but we're hopeful, uh, we're positive that uh, more effort you know would be uh, done. Um, so, like I mentioned earlier, um, you know, I was stricken by you know the public health challenges that uh, snake bite victims you know get to face. Um, I forgot to mention earlier in the introduction that uh, the patients that we see only represents about two percent, you know, of uh, the patients that actually uh, seek medical help. Um, over ninety percent, eighty percent others um, do not eventually come to the hospital. which was a community survey, uh, which revealed that only about 8% of patients seek uh, medical help. So um, over almost 90% uh, others do not seek, you know, um, help. So they eventually get treated either in the local traditional settings, you know, or um, whatever outcome, we never get to hear about them. And these are some of the challenges. And I feel that uh, there's a lot that need to be done, you know, especially in the uh, public health setting, and that was why I came up with uh, the idea to set up this uh, non-governmental organization uh, to be able to provide local solutions uh, to a global problem. And um, so ESCONET was founded in the 2021. Um, it's fully registered organization um, in Nigeria, and our vision is to be able to ensure equitable provision of uh, qualitative healthcare services in the prevention and treatment of snake bite and venom in across of Saharan Africa. And our mission is to provide uh, practical, innovative, and sustainable solutions to the public health challenges of snake bite and venom in across of Saharan Africa by focusing on training, research, anti venom supply, advocacy, and community engagement. Um, in the aspect of uh, training, um, our target is to train healthcare workers, especially those in endemic regions, and um, to be able to train students also in the healthcare training institutions to be able to provide qualitative uh, snake bite care to patients. Like I mentioned earlier, um, our medical schools in many African countries do not have a definitive curriculum, you know, on the management of uh, many of these snakes. Neglected tropical between what is taught in school and what is obtainable in the real field. And these are some of the challenges I personally faced, and uh, many other healthcare workers will attest to that. Uh, the research by Moses, for instance, you know, um, is a glaring. Uh, uh, similar researches have also been done, you know, in, in Nigeria and Africa. Um, and then in the area of research, uh, we hope to be able to collaborate with individuals and organizations, you know, to be able to uh, increase the body of evidence, you know, that is, should be available to policy makers, you know, to be able to make policies in you know, advocacy, um, is to advocate for snake bite related policy development, reviews and implementation towards coordinated multi-sectoral, you know, responses to the physical, social and economic challenges posed by snake bite and venom. And then thirdly, because of the cost of anti-venom, uh, many patients, you know, uh, tend to die, not because they don't present to the hospital, but because there is delay in the procurement of uh, anti-venom. Just like I mentioned earlier, many of them would have to go back home to be able to sell their price positions to be able to afford uh, snake bite uh, anti-venom. To stockpile anti-venom uh, according to want to be able to connect, you know, snake bite victims with uh, willing financiers uh, to be able to provide anti-venom either for free or at a reduced cost, you know, to victims. Uh, this picture here um, is a picture of me um, because of an advocacy uh, effort with the Vice President of Nigeria when I had the opportunity at the end of uh, my fellowship in the Mandela Washington uh, Fellowship, where I advocated for you know local production of antivenom and greater uh, um, supply of uh, of antivenom uh, uh, in the short term. Then uh, finally, uh, community engagement. Uh, like I mentioned, many people are not aware, 
you know, that snake bite is actually a problem in the first place. And then there's a lot that can be done to enlighten uh, individuals and communities on preventive measures, standard first aid procedures and in the event of a snake bite. And then there's need also to combat misinformation and misleading traditional beliefs pertaining to snake bite. And that's what we stand to do, you know, as uh, ESCONET. And also to encourage individuals, group and communal efforts towards ensuring early presentation of patients to recognize healthcare facilities and other uh, positive measures. Um, this picture actually was uh, taken by us, uh, some of the pioneer founders of Snake Bite Control Network, uh, and we went for a community survey and hiking around Kilan community. And then um, this picture is close to my heart because it actually um, was part of what triggered the need, you know, for a public health approach. Um, you know, to the management of uh, snake bite uh, challenge in Africa. Um, this is uh, a sensitization that is being done to patient relatives and patients alike. And I felt that if this is a representation of only the 8%, there is much more work that needed to be done outside, you know, than inside the hospital. And that was what uh, triggered the need for the non-governmental organization. These are some of the pictures before and after management. Uh, of patients that we've seen. Um, here is a six-year-old uh, girl that presented here, and then this was after treatment. Uh, um, these are also similar um, pictures. Uh, this patient, for instance, uh, actually presented to the hospital early. Uh, however, um, because of the challenges of uh, market failure of the antivenom, she, was, uh, she could not get any improvement. She lost a lot of blood at the time of presentation. Her veins were totally collapsed. If you can see, the cannula had to be inserted you know, in the um, jugular vein, for instance, uh, because we could not even access a vein to, uh, to transfuse her and uh, to administer the antivenom as required. Um, but however, uh, when she had, uh, after treatment, uh, you know, she improved markedly. And these are some of the good news about snake bite and venom. Unlike many of the other neglected tropical diseases, once you know there is access to quality management, patients more often than not you know improve. And then this is a case of a double uh, mother and child beaten you know by the same snake. Um, and it's a unique presentation. And then in this case, multiple bites, both limbs. Uh, you can imagine uh, what will happen now if to the future of this child uh, if there was no access to quality care. And then um, children are not spared. Uh, you can see this not seen child that was beaten in his left uh, hand. And then this was a bite to the forehead and then this was a bite to the perineum. So bites could actually happen anywhere. So to conclude, um, the burden of human suffering caused by snake bite has been greatly underestimated, ignored and neglected for far too long. Uh, strategies for coping snake bite and venomation must be holistic and incorporate multiple intervention systems uh, holding forth both short and long-term goals. Like I mentioned, the goal of this presentation is for us to be able to take uh, positive personal and collective efforts, you know, towards uh, saving lives and restoring the limbs, you know, of snake bite uh, and venom. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, and I would like to appreciate uh, the various uh, patients which allow me to use their pictures in the course of uh, this presentation and the Snake Bite Treatment and Research Hospital for opening my eye, you know, to the challenge of uh, snake bite and venom. Thank you very much. Well, it's a really huge thank you to you, Agom. You, you had quite a you set out with a very ambitious aim at the start of the presentation to reduce the neglect of snake bite and uh, believe this was so comprehensive that uh, although at times very made for difficult viewing it was a really important presentation and you covered so many aspects including um, some of the amazing work that uh, your equally ambitious organization has done so thank you so much it's been very impressive and certainly caused a lot of food for thought uh, for anyone within the snake bite field, but also uh, on the outside, uh, looking at this very neglected condition worldwide. So thank you for that. Uh, meanwhile, Micah Musa has uh, written in the chat, well done, Agom. 
Remigus Ezeogonwa said, thanks for the presentation. It was beautiful. It really was. <laughs> and uh, thank you to all our other attendees as well who are uh, contributing in the chat. And please uh, don't hesitate to post any questions or any comments you may have, even from your own work, uh, which we can come back to in a few moments during our, our discussion. And the last comment here from Mustafa Mohammed. Thank you, Dr. Ibrahim Aigom, for the wonderful and educative presentation. Absolutely. OK, so building on Dr. Ibrahim's presentation, it's now my pleasure to hand over to our second speaker, Moses Banda Aaron, and Moses will be talking to us a little bit more about some recent work focusing specifically on Malawi and particularly on healthcare workers' knowledge <clears throat> on the identification, management, and treatment of snakebite cases in rural Malawi. So, Moses, without any further delay, I hand over to you. Thank you. So, I will be presenting on um, a project that we're working in Malawi. Um, and giving honor to the Ben Hadnock Institute of Tropical Medicine, um, Abwez Bazao Moyo Partners in Health, from which I'm affiliated to these two institutions, and the funding from Royal Society of Tropical Medicine, um, as well as Welcome Trust, above all the government of Malawi, and also um, Ben Gurion Investor of uh, the Negev in Israel, which was also involved in the, on, on, on this project. So, our project is abbreviated Songo, which is a rock on name of the snake. Um, mostly um, a black mamba would be termed Songo. Um, so because of the issues with her snake identification, Songo might apply to many snakes. So it's a systematic overview of an epidemiology of snake bites in our district, where I am right now, Neno, Malawi and implementing guidelines and optimizing um, treatment. Um, to start with the motivation, so when I was a child about years old, my uh, father got a snake bite, and this has been um, coming um, back and forth um, through also watching some uh, National Geographic or Wild um, for some um, snakes, uh, documentaries. Okay, sorry, I'm getting a back and forth on in, on the slides. So, um, also been visited by snakes at home so many times, and I also got a small grant from the Royal Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. Um, in that, there is when you search about snake bites in Malawi, you will not find any literature regarding snake bite. And this also prompted um, us all to work on this important yet neglected um, disease. As we all know that it causes more disabilities in form of deformities, amputation, and as well as psychological distress. So this prompted us to start with the healthcare workers of which I'm going to uh, provide a snapshot. Um, but before that, we also understand that world Organization estimates snake bite worldwide to around 5.4 5.4 million cases each year, of which 1.8 to around 2.7 are cases of venomin. And the burden is mostly in Asia, Southeast Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, Central and, and, and South America. In Sub-Saharan Africa, it is estimated that 3,000 cases occur each year uh, with around 9,000 amputation and 7,000 deaths. But probably this is greatly estimated and we see a reason why such a statistics could be termed as um, underestimation. So that takes us to specific, as I said, there's no data for um, snake bites in Malawi. Malawi is a country in Southern Africa it has about 66 snakes, of which 11 are medically relevant. The population here, a gross population is our small, our small assistance, uh, subsistence farmers, who then are at risk of uh, snake bites. And then the availability of antivenom is also uh, much challenging, as a, indicated there that uh, one of our um, secondary tertiary level health facilities 
um, had to run out of snake uh, and venom, and then they had to consider um, uh, cons um, referring the patients to the traditional heroes. And the World Health Organization has a, an, a data repository where each country, all of our countries are supposed to submit data, but that data is also not available um, for malaria, as you can see in the map on the, on the bottom left, on the bottom right, sorry. So that has prompted us also to work, making sure that we make, we generate evidence that would guide at the end of the day. So we had to start with the healthcare workers, as do they have um, knowledge in terms of the treatment and management of snake bite, for it is not yet known for Malawi. So we um, conducted a cross-sectional study in Neno, which is located in the southwest part of the country, and is one of the most remote districts um, with no tarmac or asphalt road in most parts of the district, and is a possibly a mountainous also in, in the western part of the district and um, has some sort of shrub type of vegetation which makes um, conducive for uh, snakes. So our district has about 15 health facilities, which two are hospitals and 13 are health care centers. And the annual rainfall ranges about 500 to 1,000 millimeters and the temperature is pretty much warm between 15 to 38 degrees Celsius. And yet um, the population here is around 150,000 people. Out of those, only 4.5% um, have electricity. And as you can see the figures here, if it's, it rains, it means you'll get problems in, in terms of mobility. So we interviewed 150 five healthcare workers, of which 47 were nurses, 43 were clinicians, and 15 were from a pharmacy, pharmacy section. And also I reviewed outpatient and hospital admission of patients with SNEC in environment between 2018 and 2021. Um, we used a survey questionnaire, and after collecting the information, we, pre we presented some descriptive statistics, and for open-ended question, we selected some quotes that we are coming out seemingly and also mapped um, the number of cases that were recorded so I we to establish um, which part of the district has more snake bites. In the questionnaire, we included whether the healthcare workers would identify the name of the snake and whether that snake is venomous or not, because this has implication in terms of the treatment that is offered. And we found out that 89% of healthcare workers indicated that the snake bite is a problem. Uh, one healthcare worker said that had experienced many patients presenting with snake bite, including complications leading to amputation of limbs. And also 95% of healthcare workers um, reported that snake bite victims do prefer traditional healers more than the hospital. One uh, healthcare provider said, some believe that they have been bitten by a snake sent through witchcraft, therefore believe traditional healers are more efficient in treating them than hospitals. And we also um, uh, sought to understand in terms of how they do snake uh, and venom administration. And for those that have ever prescribed or administered antivenom, we found that the dosing was a problem. One said, Usually, I don't write the actual dose, I just write give snake and venom. The dosing is done in the ward. And in terms of the pictures that we are presented to them, 90% um, of healthcare workers failed to correctly identify the snake as venomous or non venomous, which implies that there is higher likelihood of administering and venom where it is not needed. From the retrospective review of snake bite, uh, we found 185 cases, uh, which translates to 36 cases per 1,000 population. 52% of them were treated as inpatient, and 72 of these were discharged within three days of admission. Uh, two patients died, seven were referred to Queen Elizabeth Central Hospital in Blanta, which is a tertiary facility, and the rest, uh, which translates to 94%, were discharged alive. So as you can see from the map, we are only on the red spot, which is a very small um, district 
uh, within Malawi, and we realized that the snake bites, the red dot is are villages that had more than four cases of snake bites, and it looks like they are central to the um, um, to the east side of the of our district. So in conclusion, we found a knowledge gap among healthcare workers, and that challenges the quality of snake bite management that is offered to the victims. And that snake bite is indeed a problem in our district. And you can get this publication, which is online, and be able to go through and understand what we exactly did. What is in progress is that we are doing um, a community survey, and out of all, we interviewed about 646, of which 379 were community members, and 267 were community health workers. So out of the 379 community members, we found 68 cases of snake bite, or those that have been bitten by a snake um, before, and this was translating to around 179 cases per 1,000 population. So we, from the same, we also considered where they seek help and found that over half of them uh, sought help from traditional healers and others uh, had to seek help from healthcare facilities while the rest uh, did a safe treatment. And uh, when we combine community health workers as well as community members, we found that less than 5% of these um, we are regarding each of the snakes that we had shown to them by showing a picture and asking them whether to identify whether it's venomous or not. They recorded that more of them as venomous, so less, less of a percent said it's non-venomous, uh, which has also problems in terms of when bitten by such a snake and what sort of treatment would be offered to them or preferences. And uh, uh, most of them said that they would use traditional methods as first aid in case of the, of the snake bite. We also did a qualitative assessment in, uh, with the traditional healer's experience, uh, which is currently under review in term, under data analysis. In terms of preliminary finding, we find that proximity makes them uh, treat more um, snake bite cases because people always come to them. And it is also believed that they remove snake fangs, unlike at a health facility, and that there is no immediate cost. Uh, that is, medicine is not for sale, so they usually tell the victims, you say, well, you can pay me later after you get fine. They also reported that they have snake bite uh, vaccine. That means if they have applied to you, the snake will not do anything if it bites you. And they reported um, that there is no death associated with the, them treating the snake bite um, cases. So in terms of the implication for tackling snake bites, we think that it is, should be a multi sectoral approach um, in order to do that. Community members need to be involved, traditional healers need to be involved, village chiefs, spiritual leaders, community health workers, facility health, uh, facility health workers, all should be involved. In addition to that, we also think that since there are other programs for, uh, that are targeting neglected tropical diseases, for example, um, during mass drug administration campaigns for chistosomiasis, for example, in Malawi, I think next by our awareness uh, could also be included in those in order to, to reach uh, more people uh, about the same. And we also believe that there is need for more funding. Um, I think each one of us here could agree with me that for the neglected tropical disease, I think more could be pumped in to say mass drug administration. But since there's no mass drug administration for snake bites, I think is one of the most neglected. So we believe to tackle snake bite, we have to engage and empower community through awareness about snakes, prevention, first aid and demand for quality care. We have to engage traditional healers and community health workers for a quick referral to the facilities and also that healthcare workers at the facility are eligible on snake bites treatment, which would build trust among snake bite victims. And overall, effective antivenom that is still at the snake type are available at the facility, and that the healthcare workers are able to administer the uh, antivenom where it is good. A special thanks should go to the Den of Institute of Tropical Medicine, the Government of Malawi, Royal Society of Tropical Medicine, Partners in Health, Welcome Trust.
and the Nguyen University of the Naked in Israel. Otherwise, thank you so much for your attention and welcome to Malawi. Thanks. Thank you very much, Moses. And we can't wait to go to Malawi. So thank you for inspiring us. But also, what a fantastic approach and uh, presentation uh, in the chat, Austin. Adobaso Manane summarizes it very well. Congratulations, Moses, on the great work you're doing in Malawi, as well as to the whole team, a hugely collaborative effort. And really, really interesting, not just in terms of snakebite, but also some fantastic ideas uh, on how to engage communities, perhaps across lots of other tropical diseases. So thank you. That's been really informative. Um, so on that note, uh, having heard about the many gaps uh, around snake bite and snake bite envenoming and what this means, particularly for those affected by it, I'd like now to hand over to Dr. Priti Mina. Do Dr. Priti, thank you for joining us and uh, you'll be giving us, thank you. And uh, we will be delighted to hear from you a little bit more about what can be done. What are some of the approaches beyond antivenoms uh, to mitigate this really devastating impact of snake bite. It's so over to you, Priti. I'm starting sharing this key. Thank you. So is my screen visible to you all? Yes, perfectly. Thank you. Sure. So at the outset, I would like to thank the organization for inviting me to express my views. Thank you so much. I'm Dr. Preeti Mina, working as assistant professor in the Department of Neurology in India. So first of all, I must say that no organ of the body is spared following the snake by disabilities and impairment. It has a huge impact on our system. So and so the burden of disability is huge. So, as I said, no organ is spared. First of all, musculoskeletal deformities are the most important part of the chronic disabilities. Patients, snake bite patient victims can have chronic non healing ulcer, abnormal gait, fixed deformities, amputation. Sometimes, chronic ulceration can even lead to malignant transformations. Although endocrine dysfunctions are rare, but delayed hypopituitarism and secondary adrenal insufficiencies can happen at the later part. As I'm a nephrologist, I'm more interested in kidney disease. Snake bite patient can have acute kidney injuries, but the more challenges when the patient land up in having persistent renal dysfunction and chronic kidney disease. Visual loss is another dreadful complication. And even CNS system is not spared. Stroke, cerebral ataxias, acute disseminated encephalitis, and GBS are rare disorders but can actually happen in the victims. Not, not just these disorders, even the mental health conditions can occur snake bite. Mostly they are psychosocial imp impairment, post-traumatic stress disorder, sometimes depression and psychogenic convulsion can also be there. But the what problem we face actually in today's world is that most, most people affected by snake bite are of productive age group and they are mostly farmers or hunters. They are the earning members of their family. And another problem we have is these patients also have some poor housing facilities, lack of productive clothing and difficult transportation terrain and poor healthcare facilities which make it more complicated to manage. So uh, the patient land up is delaying in hospital presentations, poor healthcare services, lack sometimes lack of antivenom. There can be shortage of medical personnel or harmful. Even sometimes the traditional practices are not beneficial. They are rather harmful to the patient. As I, as I talked, mental health problems can be somehow tackled with cognitive behavior therapy, intervention, or psychoeducation at the time of discharge. But what we need to do is prevent the disabilities and impairment. The foremost step in preventing this disorder is screening and detection of chronic disability related to snake bite that would require a follow-up patient. Mostly after discharge of the patient, we can actually decide what time we want to follow our patient. As it has been discussed that the, some part of the world are facing antivenom crisis. What we need today is better products, increasing production and improved distribution along without the investment to strengthen our primary healthcare system, including improvement in our infrastructure, human resource referral system, and obviously the governance. So we start with the provision of antivenom. 
it is important to educate our patients and healthcare workers on the first aid measure so they can actually tackle the problem in the field itself where the where the victim is there at the first place providing easier means of transportation patient to the health facilities is another important mission so it is also very important to to provide some funds to primary research to understand the natural history of these manifestation and to know their social and cultural aspects so we start with the management of acute investigation and imaging then we try to prevent mortality then finally we try to manage the chronic health effect of both physical and psychological we need institution of a multi component intervention to address chronic aspect of snake bite care together with the social support programs and investment in the multidisciplinary research it is it the task cannot be done by a single person or single community what we need is the complete work up with government agencies including clinician herpetologist ngos toxicologist so an integrated approach is required who has already to shown us that empower and engaging communities is important then we have to ensure safe and effective treatment increasing partnership and coordination with resources and finally strengthening our health system so as as i said that the most of these victims are the earning member of the family and if if they don't work for some time the the there could be a huge and substantial burden to the family especially economic so what our government could do is provide some type of compensation to those who have died due to snake bites or also should support the snake bite survivors so direct cash transfer or to compensate for their health expenditure like for example especially in the income by the caregiver during the acute phase stability stipend is also a good measure and we should look forward to it for example the patient is having chronic long term dialysis or limb care is required it should, government should help in this to mitigate the socio economic crisis which can triggered by snake bites so another important step is development of peer and self help groups among snake bite survivors and families so that they can share their views and the mental health illness can be also be mitigated by this and even financial work up to know the what, what the government is doing for them they can actually get these kind of groups so they can, we can actually create some kind of peer and self help groups and reorientation and strengthening the healthcare system particularly at the primary care and community level is the most most critical step that should be taken it this should be the, this should not be the last but very important thing large scale funding we require for evidence synthesis and primary research to understand and address chronic healthcare needs for the survivors and we also require high quality anthropographic and anthropologic research to explore the neglect better uh we cannot do it alone but we should we should learn it from our previous successful program for example eradication of hiv tuberculosis those programs were successful so we can help the steps taken in those program to mitigate the chronic disability in snake bite patients also so if what we require is a primary care bundle which should consist of screening institution of appropriate interprofessional care and community based rehabilitation to address all the chronic physical and mental manifestations of survivor that is required i thank you we should all work together to end the neglect that's all from my side thank you so much for listening to me thank you so much and that uh, really echoed um exactly what our previous uh, speakers and everyone working in the field of snake bite really reiterates the kind of take home the main take home message is this uh, urgent need to tackle this very collaboratively um across many sectors many stakeholders and uh, so thank you very much for outlining this and a really great presentation for um uh, the next steps and uh, towards a road map really on on how to bring drive the advocacy of snake by uh, throughout many sectors um mustafa mohammed said brief concise and brilliant thank you mina absolutely <laughs> Dr. Mina. Um and so perhaps in the next few minutes uh, we do have a few minutes for some questions and where I would like to start with uh, our our three speakers is uh, we've seen the Venn diagrams and uh, all your suggestions about who needs to be involved and I suppose my main question is based on your experience or perhaps a, a very particular experience from a local uh, perspective where would you like to see immediately 
some more engagement? Is it on the funding level? Is it at government level? Or maybe just more generally advocacy throughout the communities? Um, I suppose I, I could go in order of the presenters. Uh, Moses, perhaps you first. What, what would you like to see uh, more of? Yeah, thank you so much. So for me, I would say more of the funding because even for uh, to, to come up with evidence-based uh, research requires funding. Um, so if you look, you find that there would be more, say for example, uh, from big funders, there would be more funds that are related to other diseases and like snake bite. So I would think number one would be uh, funding related to um, snake bites uh, should be available. And the second to that is that, especially for the communities that are like in Malawi, for example, where most would prefer maybe for traditional and for various reasons, because sometimes the facilities are very far from the people to access. So they would rather go um, to maybe a nearby. So you get assisted first. So I would say that the community should also be more engaged, specifically for the traditional hearers, um, that maybe if there could be opportunities, engaging them that they should be able to uh, say, well, this kind of a case I would uh, maybe treat, and this kind of a case might need or does need an agent to refer to the facilities. And above all, when they are referring to the facilities, well, the facilities should also be equipped in terms of the knowledge, as we already said, and also for the effective antivenom, because it will still matter less if they go to the facility and then there is a problem with antivenom availability. So I, I would go for number one, funding. Number two would be the community engagement, specifically for the traditional hearers, that they would make an assessment and whether to refer the patient agently, because as um, uh, my, my colleagues from Nigeria uh, reported to say that there is more of a delay so that delay is like, okay, let me try my medicine, my black stone first. And then maybe this snake is a venomous one, which we, we all know that the end result would be would bad. By the time they are going to refer to the facility, it's already too late. I leave it to my colleagues. Um, thank you, Moses. Um, for me, I believe... Uh, you know, the more urgent thing that needs to be done is in terms of policy. I believe that uh, nations, especially in Africa, have not taken snake bites seriously. And then you'd realize that uh, snake bite envenoming um, requires a holistic approach because it's a disease of poverty. So um, simple things, it, it requires a much more um, holistic approach. It's not in the supply of the antivenom, for instance, um, if you supply antivenom and then the healthcare workers do not know how best to administer it, it will eventually be a waste. You know, um, similarly, of course, if you supply antivenom, for instance, to a facility in the local region where there is no ele electricity, you know, to cater for um, the, 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 the cold chain, you know, for instance, of course, it will also be a waste and the effectiveness would be markedly reduced. So it's a matter of policy, it's a matter of uh, there's need, need for a more holistic approach, um, you know, in, in, in the part of uh, you know, government, for instance. And uh, WHO have incessantly mentioned that, you know, part of the challenges they are having with many nations is that it is not given the, 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 the importance that it deserves. And possibly perhaps because uh, many of the victims, you know, lack a political voice, you know, they are poor, they live in the rural communities. And so um, politicians only go to those regions when they need their votes. Um, but truly speaking, many people are dying um, silently. And we, it's, it's about our humanity now and all of that. For me, policy, currently, for instance, in Nigeria, there's no definitive management guideline. You know, there is, there is no material, because that's the experience I had, for instance, uh, when I was posted to the Snake Bad Hospital. There's no particular material that, you know, this is the national guideline when it comes to snake bite management or any such thing. And these are the things that policy will be able to address, you know. Um, so for me, policy comes first. 
and then stockpiling of antivenom, and then thirdly, training of healthcare workers, you know, to be able to administer it. Because the truth of the matter is very many healthcare workers are ignorant of, you know, um, the challenges of snake bite and how to go about managing it. And of course, the, dra- the, the presentation is usually very dramatic. And if you're not careful, you would, uh, um, you know, you just lose it. And you, you may not even make the appropriate diagnosis. So a lot has to be done, um, you know, in those areas. And then um, going forward, you know, um, we can then begin to talk about community engagement, enlightenment, you know, um, uh, better health seeking behaviors and the likes of it. Thank you. Thank you, Agum. Thank you, Agum. I actually, uh, I am actually uh, with Moses on this. I believe funding is the most important thing here because, and it is also important that it should be directed to the right place. For example, the most most important problem what we face here is bringing the patient from the field, from the field from where the snake has bitten them to the hospital, especially the tertiary care, tertiary care hospital, where we can give them antivenom because it is not actually available where it should be there in the rural places where healthcare workers should be trained about the first first aid thing what should be done and especially the antivenom antivenom should be provided at the community level the primary healthcare sector only so that they can be given it as early as possible so that we can prevent most of the comorbidities that can happen later in the later part so I believe funding, then policy, community engagement, and obviously the better anti-venom and availability of anti-venom everywhere. Fantastic answers. Thank you. And uh, really bolstered, I guess, by the launch at WHO level of their global strategy on preventing uh, snake bite and controlling snake bite uh, all the way back in 2019 now. Uh, And I just wanted to mention as part of that as well, um, something that's come up a little bit, which is these gaps in data on snakebite and uh, the WHO snakebite information and data platform, for example, really attempting to uh, plug those gaps in data. Uh, Knowledge is power and data is knowledge. Um, So are are there any particular ways in which you see that um, data could be the amount of data available could be increased and perhaps building really the case very concretely towards the funding that you've mentioned is that some a challenge that you found and do you have any suggestions as to how it, this gap could be overcome i don't know who would like to go first all right perhaps i should um, come in um with regards to data data has been uh, a major challenge um like i mentioned earlier um what we have <clears throat> um currently in nigeria is an old community survey in a local community mm-hmm. you know that shows that only about eight percent of patients access you know um health care uh, snake bite victims actually access health care um, now if you look at that data the research was done in the in the 80s um, so there, there are a lot of gaps from then to now um, that actually needs to be done. And then, of course, that research was a local research. Um, so there is need to broaden, um, you know, the research, especially in the area of community survey, um, for instance, to identify the gaps properly you now with concrete data, for instance, um, in terms of, uh, you know, the needs assessments in the various communities um, in terms of, uh, you know, um, the, the, the endemicity of, you know, the snake bite itself. And um, of course, snake bite is a very sensitive issue. It's a cultural issue. There is need to bring on board, especially the traditional healers. You know, um, in Nigeria, for instance, you really cannot make any progress because like I mentioned earlier, um, the primary part of call for over 90% of patients is actually traditional healers. So um, I'm confident that uh, if, you know, um, we can take the model of, for instance, um, traditional bath attendants, how they were able to be incorporated, you know, um, a similar thing could actually be done, you know, um, to incorporate traditional healers and then to counsel them on identification of um, you know, uh, venomous uh, bites, 
you know, for instance, and the need for referral, you know, to appropriate facilities. Um, I forgot to mention earlier, uh, perhaps because of time, um, that uh, a very good number of the bites are actually non-venomous. Um, over over seventy percent of bites are from non-venomous snakes, and so um, when those bites get treated by those traditional healers, there is that pseudo sense of you know having provided treatment, um, you know, and not knowing that patients could actually do better, do well even without treatment. Um, so a lot needs to be done in identifying you know um, you know those gaps first of all, and then um, like I mentioned. There's a need for a holistic approach, and data is actually central, you know, to to what can be done. So um, there should be a, um, like um, a survey, a national survey, for instance, um, and that would give identify the gaps and then identify priority areas, and then what needs to be addressed uh, more urgently, um, you know, in that order. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Moses. Yeah, so wanted just to add on uh, Gon's presentation. So I think also that the routine in, uh, information that is being corrected, say, at each of our facilities could maybe be part of uh, the health management information system that routinely corrects the, just like the way we do maybe a report on monthly basis uh, on maternal and child health, for example. Mm -hmm. so, we could have something related to snake bite, like a form that, or some data points that could be incorporated in um, one of the maybe say reports that we report on neglected tropical diseases as part of it. And even that uh, small information uh, will contribute in terms of accounts, like how many do we see um, to the facilities, and uh, at the end of it all, um, at country level. How, how, how many cases have we maybe seen in a particular period in time? Um, maybe as we await for the real uh, national or uh, national survey, maybe uh, this is something that could be done. Uh, it means that we will keep track of all um, victims that have at least visited the facility. And then from there, we can also add, as he had previously said, maybe do a national thorough survey that would be... Uh, entail also incorporating patients that had not visited the facility. So I think data remains um, key in advocacy because we, we have to show evidence. Um, and it, based on that evidence, we'll be able to uh, like uh, maybe generate much attention to, to snake bite as well. I think WHO through their web portal, I think they have started like calling for countries to submit this data. But then even that call can only be done if uh, systems are available even from like health uh, centers uh, cascade to maybe like a district or a provincial hospital and that cascade goes to up to a national level. They'll be able to, supp to supply that data to WHO. But if that kind of system is not available, then definitely, yes, the call will be there, but even at the national level, there's nothing that they can do over. Well, that's been uh, a very some very concrete and important suggestions from from both of you, and and also uh, it's really interesting to hear what you anticipate the challenges to be, um, but definitely something to work towards. I, I was going to ask Preeti to to add her contributions to that, but she's uh, she's also kind of dropped out of the room. Uh, but and um, not to worry. Yes, Ego. Okay, um, in the absence of Preeti, um, maybe I should mention that, um, you know, some of these efforts have been made at the local level. For instance, while I was in the Snake Bite Hospital, we formed uh, a local research group um, where there's a pro forma uh, that we collect data, and then um, every year that data is analyzed. Um, and then at the local level, uh, without funding and all of that, this was. Um, you know, all um, in an effort to boost, you know, the availability of data. Um, and then um, a lot has been done in Nigeria, for instance, by the Snake Bite Research and Intervention Center, mm -hmm. um, which I was uh, privileged to, you know, um, be part of uh, their many researches. Um, a lot of it is funded by the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. 
Um, so they are like uh, the research coordinating body in Nigeria. And there's a network of researchers from uh, various, uh, you know, hospitals, you know, in endemic settings you know, that attend to, to SNEC. So periodically, um, you know, we meet to appraise the situation and then to share experiences, you know, um, and uh, to prefer solutions to, you know, prevailing uh, challenges. So I think in that regard, um, a lot is being done. But of course, of course, um, funding is key. You know, um, there's a lot of work and it requires, it has to be funded. Uh, there was actually a great question from uh, Deborah Hosman from the Bernard Nocht Institute. And it was actually addressed to Dr. Priti, but I suppose we can open it up to all the speakers. And it was just about um, asking really when government officials or more formal institutions are approached asking for different stipends and support, uh, what has their reaction to the suggestions been? It's a very compelling uh, case to tackle snake bite, but uh, what on a practical level, what have some of your, in your experience, the response to these requests for more resources and more spotlight on snake bite, how's that been met? Moses, would you like to? Right, um... Oh, hang on. <laughs> I don't mind. <clears throat> All right, thank you. Um, in terms of resources, um, I believe uh, the government is, is receptive. Uh, for instance, in Gombe State, where I practice, um, you know, the government saw the need to increase. Uh, the hospital actually began as a ward uh, in a different hospital. And uh, seeing the need, you know, the government uh, has done so much, actually. Uh, they establish um, a full-blown hospital uh, primarily for, you know, um, the treatment of snake bites. And in addition, um, every year there's an amount of uh, budgeting that is done uh, to supply antivenom for free, you know, um, to victims. And Gombe State government must be really, really commended, you know, in that regard. Uh, some time ago, the federal government also uh, make uh, supply antivenoms for free, but um, resource allocations have been dwindling, dwindling uh, you know, in recent times. Um, but honestly, Gombe State government must be commended. However, um, it's worthy of note that you know the patients are not primarily from Gombe, and uh, it should be treated as you know a national problem rather, rather than a local. Uh, problem. So other regions, especially in the northeastern part of Nigeria, from where majority of the patients, you know, in that setting are seen, should actually, you know, copy what, you know, when the state government is doing. So, but like I mentioned earlier, um, many of these officials are truly, truly unaware, you know, of the challenges that uh, snake bite victims actually go through. So, and that is the need for advocacy. We need to let them know that there is this problem you know, in every opportunity that, you know, we have, you know, to come in contact with them. So very many of them are actually receptive, you know, and they are willing to, you know, prefer, you know, solutions to these challenges. But truly speaking, many of them don't even know about it. Uh, and they don't, uh, some that do know about it, uh, they do not know of, you know, the, um, the, the extent of the problem, for instance. You know, until when it is presented to them, you know, in a picture that, you know, they would understand. Um, so um, I believe, you know, there's, there's, there's room for advocacy and there's room for partnerships, for collaborations at various levels, you know. Um, and as, as, you know, we have the opportunity, we need to be able to sell out, you know, this information uh, so that, you know, something can be done about it. Moses, would you like to add to this at all? Sure. So just to concur um, that many of the instances when you present um, snake bites, even to the people that are around, uh, the first thing is like, what snake bite? Is it an issue? Is it really an issue? So mm -hmm. what does that mean? It, 
simply means that there is more work that has to be done in order when you present there is evidence and this evidence can even inform or uh, make the government authorities to even lobby for i mean lobbying maybe from a researcher like me would be somehow maybe tailored to where to the area that i work but maybe even from the government side can uh, lobby maybe from um, um, donors that they could uh, say ensure that there is availability of say antivenom that healthcare workers uh, have knowledge over the same and possibly also uh, make strive to include snake bite as part of the healthcare workers uh, curriculum which i think uh, in most african countries is seem to be not uh, included or if it's included it's not dealt to the depth that it should be so uh, all those i think would still go back to do we have the data that we can go to the government and say look here is the situation this is how it is this is how grave the situation is so we have to act now in terms of Malawi, for example, there has been, as I said, read if you search, you find none. But of course, conversation have always been there with the government, especially with the provision of antivenom. There have been some instances where um, the government itself has run out of antivenom and perhaps also go to um, NGOs that are operating. So in Neno, for example, uh, the, the polyvalent antivenom that is available is provided by partners in health which I think is from um, the government side to say, well, look, maybe this will not, but you could equally uh, supply that. So uh, by engaging other um, INGO or local NGO, I think it would also be something that the government could equally do so long we, we approach with evidence that this is indeed an issue. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And it's a shame Priti hasn't, at least from what I can see on my side, I don't think she's been able to reconnect yet. Yeah. Um, so that's a shame. If she comes back, we'll definitely ask her to uh, build on that. And also, I've, Deborah, I've seen your additional comments, so I'll, I'll certainly put that to her. Um, we're coming up towards the end of our time. It's It's been an amazing session, uh, honestly, so eye-opening. There was just one last question. I think that's come up a lot, uh, both uh, at the same time in the presentations, also in the chat. Um, Deborah Hosman also has been posting a recent paper on this topic, but it was just perhaps to finish off on this uh, really important dimension of traditional healers uh, Agom, you were saying 90% of those affected by snake bite first go to walk through a traditional healer. And I was just curious to know whether that experience was slightly different uh, in Malawi and India. Um, I, I hope Priti can come back on and um, elaborate a little bit on that. But just in general, um, what in what ways and what, what are the similarities or rather differences in the ways in which you might work with that phenomenon and with that aspect of um, healing in the different regions? Thank you so much. So I think I also made uh, like in the presentation, of course, the data hasn't been like finalized yet. It's still in uh, analysis phase. They've been, but the preliminary results of the 68 registered cases that we've had um, over 60 percent of them had gone to the traditional healers first. So which simply means and, and then if uh, we also incorporated the questions to say if you were to be bitten by a snake today, um, would you go to the hospital or, or, or which which um, uh, which treatment would you consider first? So um, out of that, we also found that 70% of the respondents said that I would go to a traditional and some of the reasons were ranging from the distance that they are to the facility and the belief that the snake maybe is through um, some maybe witchcraft and, and other reasons that we are also provided over the same, which scores the point that indeed, if we are doing do a good work, we have to engage the traditional healers, specifically as, as uh, that most of the snakes are non-venomous or the bites are non-venomous. 
well, that would simply do a pseudo, as uh, my colleague had already said, to say, well, there the, uh, is 100% treatment success rate that everyone that goes to a traditional healer gets healed. And uh, maybe for those that are venomous and if the situation is critical, that's where the time they will refer to the facility. And then the, the, at the facility, for example, if the person dies. So in that way, we'll see as at the facility, things are not working while Saturday traditional are working. And in this way, that will increase the confidence of uh, the community members to go more to the traditional healers, maybe compared to the facility. But if we look at the process holistically, we realize that the traditional healers are, uh, they are supposed to be engaged. And as I said, they need to identify are there signs of envenoming if that could be done. And well, if they look at that and say, okay, this is the case that I should not do. Maybe I should immediately refer this case to to the facility because it's still a belief and you know something that is a belief it's not easy to just break it so we cannot just wake up one day and say well you need not to go to the traditional healers they will still be going but how do we then make sure that they go and then we also access them at the facility level in time that is the main point that we have to refocus and think uh, quite well because they will still be visiting Thank you. Agom, would you like to add anything to this? Yes, let me just give a little perspective to, you know, the health skin behavior, you know, of, um, of patients with regards to, you know, hospitals. Um, first of all, we need to understand that, uh, you know, uh, the decision not to approach hospitals in some instances is actually as a result of, you know, the experiences that certain members of the community have had, you know, negative experiences in that regard, you know, um, that some members of the community have had with uh, hospital management. And like I mentioned earlier, um, you know, considering the fact that it's a very costly, um, uh, you know, endeavor uh, compared to the local traditional healers, and then um, if, for instance, you know, they go to a hospital and then um, they do not get the required treatment. And then despite spending a lot of money, you know, um, the patients end up uh, either dying or coming down with uh, terrible morbidities. Now, these stories tend to spread fast in the communities and it further discourages others, you know, from, from, from seeking, uh, you know, help from from the hospitals and then there are other communities also that believe you know like i mentioned earlier it is laced with many mythologies so there are other uh, you know communities that believe that you know going to a hospital or even receiving an injection after a patient had been uh, beaten could result in immediate death you know for instance or that the gods will be unhappy with you or uh, and then others believe that snake bites do not just happen there is actually a spiritual, you know, uh, matter, and that is why you know they go to those traditional healers. And the traditional healers, we need to understand, are very powerful in those communities. You know, they people listen to them. You know, and that is why they need, you know, to be brought in, you know, into, um, 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 you know, into into into, uh, you know, the, the management. Uh, of snake bite because people listen to them and sometimes they tell the patients outrightly that if you go to a hospital you would actually die you know from this snake bite and then they will tell you that no this bite is not normal that it was actually sent to you by so 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 and so 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 and then uh, of course they tend to listen to them and like I mentioned they are powerful in those communities and so you would understand why you know sometimes entire communities have a very poor health skin behavior Sometimes the very few ones that eventually get to the hospital are the stubborn ones, you know, that damn the consequences and really want to do something about, you know, their situation. And those are the ones that they are eventually get to the hospital. So these are actually the, 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 the perspective, you know, that we should have with regards to the health skin behavior. So there's a need for a more holistic approach, uh, sensitivity to the cultures of people, and um, uh, generally a value reorientation you know, and, and, and gradual, you know, um, 
change you know of you know this health seeking behavior by continuous advocacy and enlightenment um, so i think this these are some of the issues thank you and that was some very wise words uh, not just in context of snake bite but even fake news and covid in the west and lots of other uh, circumstances and situations so thank you that's been really very, very useful. And it's a shame we couldn't get the Indian perspective. Uh, Preeti doesn't seem to have been able to reconnect. So it will have to be for uh, a next webinar. There was so much ground to cover. And we're really, really grateful for your time, uh, especially at the end of what I'm sure has already been a very long day. Uh, it's much appreciated. Lots of people in the comments uh, thanking you for, you know, for the thanking the brilliant speakers and uh, for this wonderful session. We hope at ISNTD that it's gone some of the way to showing snake bite, not just as a neglected tropical disease, but also as a major and preventable cause of disability worldwide. Uh, we're 100% committed to the advocacy behind this. And uh, so it's been a real pleasure spending these 90 minutes roughly in your uh, really wonderful company learning so much so thank you and congratulations to you and all the teams behind you um, in all this work that you've presented um austin adobasa manan is writing many thanks to the speakers and organizer for this wonderful webinar quite insightful discussions and knowledge sharing absolutely and uh, a last very big thank you as well to our audience who's tuned in and and again at the end of a long day so hello to Mawuli Aglanu, Han Jansen, Rabiu Ibrahim, Mustafa Mohammed, can't name everyone, Micah Musa, Christelle, Gbagwidi. Welcome and thank you for staying uh, with us during this session. Uh, so from us here at ICNTD, it's going to have to be goodbye. And uh, we hope very much to, to catch up very soon, whether it be on the topic of snake bite or some of the uh, numerous and varied topics we'll be covering at ISNTD Connect very soon. So thank you, Moses. Thank you, Agon. And uh, we can't wait to hear more from what you'll be doing next with all this energy and this massive passion and dedication uh, to the snake bite cause. Thank you for your time. Thank, thank you, you very so much. much. Yeah. Thank you, Take everyone. Take care. All the best, Bye. everybody. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye.